you for your patience, those of you who are waiting for us online. Um, we welcome you to this Google Hangout today, Voto Latino, and I want to thank each and every one of our panelists. Uh, so let me start out by introducing them. Today we'll be covering the topic of immigrant families and the Affordable Care Act. And as we've continued to host these Google Hangouts uh, the past couple of months at Voto Latino, um, most of the questions that we've gotten from you, our audience, are somehow related to, um, to mixed status families or immigrant families. Families, families where um, possibly not all members are, are, are citizens or maybe not here legally. And with different immigration statuses, we know that it can be really confusing to navigate this law. Uh, so I want to thank our panelists for coming together today online to answer the questions that, that the Voto Latino audience has. Um, joining us today, we have Alvaro Huerta. He is a staff attorney with the National Immigration Law Center. Uh, thank you so much, Alvaro. Alvaro focuses his work on making sure that low-income immigrant families are not denied access to quality health care. And so he, this is an issue that he feels very passionate about, and we're really glad to have him join us. Uh, we also have Mayra Alvarez with us. Mayra is the Associate Director of the Office of Minority Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. And so she is at the, at the core of, of all that is going on related to the Affordable Care Act. Um, so thank you, Mayra, so much for lo loaning us your expertise today. We also have Samantha Pass. Samantha is the Director of Health Advocacy for Hispanic Federation. Uh, Hispanic Federation is one of our great partners on this healthcare campaign, and we're, we're really happy to be working with you and to have Samantha with us today. Um, joining us shortly, we also will have Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez from California's 46th District. She is currently on the floor of the House of Casting Votes, uh, but she'll be with us in just a couple of minutes. She represents, um, as I mentioned, California's 46th district, which includes cities in northern Orange County. Um, she has launched an initiative called Countdown to Enroll OC, and she's very passionate about making sure that her constituents um, are enrolled in health coverage through the law. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being with us. Uh, let's go right to our questions. Again, these questions were submitted by the Voto Latino audience, um, and we thank you so much. We couldn't have this content um, without you guys sending us your questions. So. Hopefully you find the answers that, that you're looking for. Um, the first question comes to us from Karen uh, in New Jersey, and she asks, I am a dreamer and have DACA status or deferred action. Uh, can I apply for health insurance on the health insurance marketplace? Um, and Alvaro will be able to answer that for us. Sure. Thanks, Jan Thank uh, Unfortunately, folks with deferred action for childhood arrivals or DACA status are unable to access the marketplaces. Um, however, they may have other options in their state, so it's worth checking to see what they are eligible. For example, in California, they may qualify for Medi-Cal um, if they're eligible for that program there. Um, unfortunately, they don't have access. It's something that the Obama administration, we, we've, we're recommending that they should fix. I think it would help to get a lot more folks enrolled, so hopefully that fix is coming. Thank you so much for that for that answer. So, um, just to summarize that really quickly, um, if someone has DACA status in most states, they can't enroll, but they should check on their on their state's regulations. Correct? That's right, Yandari. Um, each state will have different rules. They can't. They aren't eligible for the state exchanges, um, okay. but they may be eligible for other programs within the state. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, our next question comes um, from. Advocates for Youth, one of our, our other really great organizations that we partner with. Uh, this question is uh, from from one of um, from a, a young lady who asks, "I'm a young person who is covered under my parents' health plan. Can I get birth control without my parents finding out?" So this one doesn't necessarily tie into immigration, but um, it was an important question that we wanted to make sure our audience had an answer for. Uh, Samantha, can you help us with that one? Sure. So the answer really depends on what health insurance company the person has. Um, a lot of the different insurance companies will send a statement at the end of the month with all of the services that were provided. And that would include any prescriptions that were distributed. So you need to really check with the insurance company and see what they include and if they would be willing to leave it off there. There's also some differences depending on whether that person is under the age of 18 or over the age of 18. So the best option would be to call the insurance company. Got it. So that means that even if someone is over 18 but is still insured by their parents' plan, um, they, their parents still might find out on the statement what health services they're receiving, correct? Possibly, yes, definitely. There is the opportunity for that to happen. I do know of certain cases where 
for example, a 25-year-old was on their parent's plan and they called, spoke to the insurance company and let them know that, you know, this was their personal health information and they didn't want it shared with their parents and all of their services came in a separate envelope addressed specifically to them. Okay, got it. Um, thank you. That that helps clarify. So basically, um, if anyone happens to be wondering that question for your personal situation, check with your health insurance company for more details. Um, thank you. Um, might I help, I'm hoping you can help us with this next question. This one comes from Esvaldo from California, and he says, I'm a 28-year-old United States citizen. I live with my mom, but I am financially independent. Um, I'm trying to enroll for health insurance, but when the application asks how many people live in my household, should I put just myself or all family members in my house? Um, so essentially, some, some, a lot of people uh, might run into this uh, in the Voto Latino audience. If you're a young person and you um, live with family members, but you, you support yourself financially, um, how should they go about filling that out, Maida? It is a great question, and I think a lot of people want to be clear on what information they're going to need when they want to apply for coverage on the marketplace. In particular, if they want to find out if they qualify for lower costs on the marketplace coverage, they do need to provide specific uh, household member information and income. The marketplace information then uses that information to provide the person applying, in this case Esvaldo, uh, the information about whether he's eligible for those lower costs. So when he fills out the application, he's supposed to include information about the household. So information like himself, if he's married, any children that might live with him, um, his unmarried partner, anyone else under 21 that they take care of, that lives with them, um, anyone basically that he can claim as his dependent on his tax return. But it's important that he doesn't need to include folks that... Um, folks that are not his dependent or other relatives that file their own tax return and are not his dependent. So on, on healthcare.gov or cuidadodesalud.gov, Bechica, there is important information about household information and there's also a link out to a fact sheet that's provided by the IRS that explains this information in more detail. But in, gen in general, he should only include information uh, that's uh, specific to his tax return. Got it. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who uh, might be watching this after the live broadcast, we'll be sure to link to that uh, that page that might have just uh, mentioned that fact sheet after the fact. So, okay. So let me see if I understand. So essentially, someone um, like Osvaldo should um, not be worried that living with family will affect uh, his or her status for qualifying for tax credits, as long as um, those people aren't dependents of 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 Osvaldo or whoever's applying. Is that right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, for um, for any young people who uh, might live with family members or or others who are not their dependents, um, you can still qualify. Um, just make sure that you put the people who are dependent on you, and you don't need to put everybody who lives in in your house um, if they don't depend on you financially. Uh, thank you so much, Maida. Okay. Our next question. Um, going back to. Um, our mixed status families. Uh, this person asks, if I have a social security number but I'm undocumented, do I have to enroll for health insurance and can I? Uh, Samantha, can you help us understand that one a little better? Sure. This is a question that we get a lot because some people have social security numbers or ITIN numbers and they think that they can enroll with that. If that number does, was not assigned to you specifically, you cannot enroll with that number. Um, Social Security numbers have to be valid and assigned to you, otherwise it's actually a crime to use that to enroll. So it's really important that people make that distinction and understand that if that number at any point was assigned to somebody else or they you know, bought it essentially, that they need to not use that. That's really important. And Got unfortunately... It. Unfortunately, because of that, they won't be able to enroll. Um, someone who is undocumented, will they be, will they be li liable to the fine associated with the law? No. So although they're not allowed, I mean, they don't get the benefit of being able to enroll in the marketplace, but thankfully they also do not have any fines to pay. The fine is not applicable to anybody who is undocumented. Got it. So in conclusion, um, unfortunately those who are undocumented will not be able to register for health insurance on the health care marketplace. Um, they also won't be liable for the penalty. And you also, Samantha, you mentioned um, an ITIN number. Can you um, just quickly explain a little bit about what that is for those who are listening who may not be familiar? 
Sure. The ITIN number is actually a tax ID number, and there's a lot of undocumented people who pay taxes and have taxes taken out of their paycheck. And usually they're assigned a number so that they can file for their taxes um, every spring. That number does not qualify you to be able to enroll in the healthcare marketplace. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question actually is very similar to something that you just covered, Samantha. Um, and Alvaro, if you'll help us with this one. Um, this person asks, uh, how will the law affect a person who is undocumented and who applies for health insurance using a social security number that is legitimate but not theirs? Samantha touched a little bit about, uh, about this subject, but Alvaro, can you shed a little bit more light for us? Sure. So as Samantha said, someone who's undocumented, even if they're working with a social security number, is not eligible for coverage under the marketplaces. However, they might have an eligible family member, a child, for example, who is a citizen mm -hmm. or is otherwise eligible, and they can and should enroll that person into coverage. Um, when asked for their own social security number, they should not enter that information. If they are the non-applicant, if they're not applying for themselves, they don't have to provide a social security number. Um, instead, they can provide the information of their child or other eligible family member um, and get that person enrolled. Um, at the same time, the pers if the person is not eligible themselves, um, they should understand that none of their information will be used uh, for immigration enforcement purposes. Um, the Immigration uh, and Customs Enforcement has made very clear that they are not interested in using the information gathered by the marketplaces when someone applies for coverage. Uh, to enforce immigration laws. So they should have no fear that um, that when they're enrolling eligible family members that um, any of that, uh, none of that should deter them from enrolling family members. And that's an important point that um, I think is one of the big challenges in enrolling um, Latinos. Um, a lot of people don't understand that um, enrolling their family members who are eligible won't put them at risk uh, in their immigration proceedings. So thank you so much for uh, for covering that, Alvaro, that's a, a really important point. And for those of you who are listening, who um, have family members who might be in this situation, um, please share that information with them. We want to make sure that uh, that all Latinos who can be covered and all Americans who can be covered uh, by by this law are able to get health insurance. And um, even if their their situation and their family is a little bit complicated, it's still possible for them to to apply without putting their family members at risk. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you so much for sending that question. Um, this one came from Bedrin. Uh, it was a really great question. Um, OK, so um, narrowing it down a little bit to uh, our immigrant women, um, Maida, um, if you'll help us with this one. Uh, this question is, can undocumented women receive care during pregnancy under the Affordable Care Act? What is the process for them to apply? So it's a great question. Um, I'm sure there are many families out there that might be wondering this, and it's important to know that the Medicaid rules um, didn't change for pregnant women because of the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, what the Affordable Care Act did for the Medicaid program is give states the opportunity to expand it so that more people could qualify for Medicaid coverage. Um, in fact, everyone under 138% of the poverty level, or about you know um, $15,000 for an individual, mm -hmm. has the opportunity to qualify um, in those states that choose to expand, and we're encouraging more and more states to do so. About half of them have done so. So far. Um, but generally, Medicaid offers care to pregnant women that includes prenatal care through pregnancy, labor, and delivery, and for about 60 days postpartum, as well as other pregnancy related care. But in order to receive this full coverage in Medicaid, that pregnant woman has to meet income, state residency, and citizenship or immigration status criteria. So because of that rule, undocumented pregnant women would not be eligible for full coverage in Medicaid. What is available to undocumented women that are otherwise eligible for, for Medicaid um, to receive emergency Medicaid is that payment for emergency services, which in this instance would be that labor and delivery of the child. Um, the coverage under Medicaid for this woman is generally limited to that labor and delivery unless she's experiencing some other type of um, uh, healthcare emergency situation that needs to be treated. Um, I do want to note that some states offer CHIP coverage, which is the Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, some, some states have extent, expanded their Medicaid program and, and it's a CHIP program. They do offer coverage for uh, the unborn child. Um, it's about 12 to 13 states that have elected to offer this coverage 
and that coverage is offered to pregnant women regardless of her immigration status during her pregnancy, but it can also include some postpartum care. It really varies from state to state, and we do have um, more information available on Medicaid.gov. Uh, there's the other um, specific instances related to the child. Once that child is born, they're automatically deemed Medicaid eligible and have that coverage. Um, so the child can at least be taken care of um, and ensure that that child is healthy for their first year of life. Got it. Um, and Maida, will any of that change if um, a woman lives in a state that didn't expand Medicaid or is that irrelevant when it comes to pregnant women? That's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Uh, the Affordable Care Act didn't do anything to change this part of the law or the part of existing Medicaid law. Got it. Okay. So in conclusion, um, undocumented women um, do have some sort of leeway to um, provide care for for the child that they're carrying while they're pregnant and afterwards for the child as well, right? Uh, for labor and delivery, labor I mean, and emergency, delivery. yeah, emergency Medicaid is offered for for labor and delivery services unless they live in certain states um, that offer that coverage, uh, which is a little bit more extensive than just labor and delivery, because that's truly an emergency when you're when you're about to have your baby and you have to go to the hospital. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so that touches on our next question. Our next question actually was, what is emergency Medicaid and how do I know if I qualify for it? Is there anything um, else that our listeners need to know about that than what you've covered already, Maida? So, so one thing in general for folks to know is that emergency Medicaid is exactly that. It's intended to cover emergency related services for folks. Um, so there is coverage available, there's funds available for states to uh, take care of that uninsured population um, that are otherwise eligible for Medicaid except for immigration status, for example. Um, so if someone uh, you know, has a, an appendicitis and their appendix is about to burst, that's an emergency condition and they can go to the emergency room and have emergency Medicaid um, uh, pay for that for that care uh, through the hospital or whatever. Um, but it is specific to emergency related services, um, so it's important to emphasize that. Got it. And how do I'm sorry, um, you might have covered this already and I missed it. But how yeah. uh, does someone go about applying for emergency Medicaid? Or is it something great. that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, so that's a great, it's a great point. It's not necessarily that you apply for emergency Medicaid. It's more so how, how hospitals are, um, are able to then pay for that co the, the coverage of those services. So it's not like the individual is going to go in with, a, you know, an appendicitis and say, I want to apply for emergency Medicaid. It's more the payment mechanism that the hospital uses to cover the cost of the care of paying for that uninsured, undocumented person. Got it. Thank you. Um, sure. It's a hard issue. Thank you so much for breaking it down a little bit more. Um, our next question is one that I thought was a really great question. Um, the person asks, if I own a small business and am undocumented, am I still required to cover my employees? How does the law apply to me and my business? Um, we know that Latinos are uh, like rank really high in number of small business ownership, and um, this is a question that will affect a lot of our community. Uh, Samantha, what's the answer to that question? Sure. So. Whether a small business needs to offer insurance to their employees doesn't depend on if the person is documented or not. It depends on the size of the business. So for right now, the businesses don't need to worry because small businesses don't have to provide coverage before next year. And any business um, less than 50 people, less than 50 full-time employees, doesn't have to provide coverage. But should they so choose, for businesses 25 employees or less, there are some tax incentives for those businesses. We also heard recently that there was an update by um, you know, the White House administration that businesses between 50 and 100 employees have until 2016 to um, offer coverage to their employees. So there's a lot of different situations, but it all boils down to how many full-time employees do you have. So if that person has, you know, 53 full-time employees, whether they're documented or not, they will need to provide coverage. Um, okay, so in essence it doesn't matter. Um, this person also had mentioned that their business partner was um, documented, so it really, it really doesn't matter the status of the business owner. Um, they still have to comply with the laws that apply to all small businesses, is that right? Right. That okay. the law is is about the size of the business. Got it. Um, and Maida, I'm sure that there's a fact sheet or um, a web page somewhere with more information on that, right? 
Absolutely. Uh, there's information related to small business questions at the Small Business Administration healthcare page, and you can look at that at sba.gov, but okay. also healthcare.gov and Cuidado de Salud both offer resources as well. Okay, thank you. And that's that'll be one of the links that we'll add to this video um, afterwards. So for those of you who are going to watch this over or watch this after the live broadcast ends, we'll be sure to link to that for you. Um, thank you so much. Um, okay, Maida, we're coming back to you. Um, this question is, if the cost of my employer-provided health insurance increases after March 31st, will I have the option to enroll via the marketplace? And I guess I should just um, explain a little bit. So right now we're in an open enrollment period where anybody who is eligible for health coverage can sign up uh, through healthcare.gov, through cuidadosalud.gov, uh, through, you know, you have a couple of ways that you can do it. Um, and you have until March 31st. After March 31st, um, uh, then th it'll be it'll be different um, on whether you're able to to enroll. And so this person's asking um, if, if they currently have health insurance through, they change their mind and want to enroll through the marketplace later because the cost goes up. Will that be an option, Maida? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Um, so generally, affordability is determined by calculating the employee's share of the annual premium for the lowest cost self-only plan the employer offers that meets the minimum value standard. There's a lot of fancy words right there. Um, but basically what we want to make sure is that people are getting coverage that's good quality, that offers a, you know, a good package of services that is affordable to them um, so that they can rest assured that they don't have to worry about the cost of their health insurance and really um, get the peace of mind that health insurance is supposed to provide. Um, if that the cost of that coverage for the employee is more than 9.5% of their annual income, then it's deemed unaffordable. And at that point, uh, the, in, the employee is able to go into the health insurance marketplace to purchase coverage on their own. Um, and, and obviously, the employer would have certain consequences as a result of that. It's important to note that, like you said, this is an open enrollment period time. So if that were to happen, if, for example, in August, an employer says, you know, I don't want to offer this plan anymore, that obviously is out of the, the hands of the employee and would therefore trigger a special enrollment period. Um, which allows that individual to go back to the marketplace and have the opportunity to purchase coverage through the marketplace as people are doing right now during open enrollment. Um, but really you need to have a, a certain uh, qualifying event, which is another fancy term for something has to give you the opportunity to qualify for a special enrollment period. Got it. And um, are there any other um, situations you mentioned? Um, uh, age, I believe. Um, yeah, definitely. What are some of the others? So one thing to keep in mind, if, if we get married, if, some, if a person gets married, that's a qualifying event. Things are going to change because you might want to go on your spouse's plan or they might want to join your plan. If you have a baby, that's a qualifying event because who knows uh, if you're going to want a different plan or a different network of doctors. Mm. Um, if you graduate college, you know, perhaps you were on your student plan and you want to be able to, you're not going to have that anymore. That's a qualifying event. Or you get a, a job that um, offers you employer-sponsored co coverage, that's a qualifying event because you will no longer need that marketplace. So there's a lot of different reasons for why you can drop your marketplace coverage or you can trigger a special enrollment period to enroll in a plan through that marketplace. Again, all this information is available on healthcare.gov, um, but there are obviously situations that people should be aware of so that they don't get penalized later for no reason. Got it. Um, so in conclusion, if you can, uh, for now, eligible, or if Oh, I'm stuttering, sorry. Um, just make sure that you're enrolled by March 31st, but know that if something does change in your situation, um, a, a life-changing event, you do still have the option to get covered after March 31st. Um, thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from Martha. Uh, Martha works in a clinic that provides care to low-income patients, and she asks, is a person eligible for health coverage under the Affordable Care Act? if he or she has submitted immigration paperwork but has not yet received a green card? Um, Alvaro, what's the answer to Martha's question? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and fortunately, the answer is yes. Um, and so people who have an approved I-130 petition or family petition and are adjusting their status or getting their green card, in other words, are considered lawfully present for purposes of the Affordable Care Act. Um, so proof of both having a family petition that's approved and a pending application for adjustment should be sufficient to, to get that person enrolled. Um, 
and there, there are other kind of documents that you might be able to use to prove that you are have an application for a green card pending, like a work permit, for example, that indicates, that has a code, that you're adjusting your status. So on healthcare.gov, there is a list of documents, uh, immigration-related documents, and the, the type of information that's on them that you can use to you know, input into the application and show that you are indeed, you do indeed have a pending adjustment uh, application. Got it. Thank you. So essentially, um, those who who are kind of in limbo for the moment should still go ahead and apply, correct? That's right. As long as they have an approved family petition and are adjusting their status, even if they don't have the green card in hand, okay. um, they are eligible to enroll. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, all right, We're, we'll move on to um, our next question. Uh, so this question um, deals again with the different technicalities for immigration statuses. Um, do all legal permanent residents qualify for Affordable Care Act health coverage? Uh, and are there circumstances where they might not qualify? For those not familiar with that term, legal permanent resident or LPR, uh, that's somebody who has a green card. So, Maida, is there uh, any sort of circumstance where um, an LPR wouldn't qualify for health coverage? Uh, that's a, a great point. Um, so, what the people that qualify for coverage through the marketplace are either U.S. citizens or lawfully present immigrants. So, it's another LPR, but not legal permanent resident, but lawfully present. <laughs> uh, so, it's it's um, there's a lot of LPs. Um, but lawfully present, uh, like Alvaro said when he said there's, there's, there's a, a list of statuses that are um, eligible for a health insurance marketplace coverage on the website, it definitely is. And, it, and it's long. It includes everyone from lawful permanent residents, um, which are green card holders, but also asylees, refugees, um, people that are battered non-citizens or victims of trafficking. There's a variety of categories. And we want to make sure that folks that are eligible do take this opportunity to uh, get the coverage that they can um, get through the marketplace. because so important um, for legal permanent residents or lawfully present uh, lawfully present immigrants that are in the United States. Um, they also have the option to get access to tax credits, and that's particularly important because people are really worried about the cost of health insurance coverage and how much it's going to take out of their pocket. Um, so it's important to know that lawfully present immigrants are going to have access to tax credits through the marketplace to help them pay for that coverage um, in every state. And for in certain states that have expanded their Medicaid program, they might have the opportunity to enroll in Medicaid and CHIP and get that type of coverage, right? That's for folks that are generally making below 138% of poverty, or what we talked about, that, that $15,000 for an individual. Um, but for states that have decided to not expand their Medicaid program, they will actually still get access to tax credits, even if they are below 100% of the federal poverty level. And that's a point of confusion for a lot of folks across the country, um, but it's important to emphasize that um, law, legal permanent residents do have access to tax credits um, through the marketplace at whatever level of, of the federal poverty line that they are. And, and we, we hope folks will be able to go to, to the website and be able to do that. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about five-year bar and Medicaid and CHIP? Yeah, um, I know that for certain... Um federal benefits that um, legal yeah. permanent residents have to wait five years. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Sure. So under current law, um, most LPRs or legal permanent residents or green card holders do have this five-year waiting period, which means they have to wait five years after receiving their immigration status or that qualified immigration status before they're eligible to get that Medicaid or CHIP coverage. Um, but it's also important to note that there are some states that have uh, removed that five-year bar. Five -year bar that five-year waiting period. So they have offered that coverage um, immediately for uh, legal permanent resident uh, pregnant women or children or other family members. Um, we, all, we know that 26 states plus the District of Columbia and the Commonwealth of the uh, Northern Mariana Islands have decided to do this, as well as 21 states have decided to do this um, for lawfully residing children or pregnant women under CHIP. So that's for a higher level of income. Um, again, this is a lot, uh, and it's a lot is based state, uh, state by state. It varies from state to state because these are uh, state federal partnership programs. Um, so we encourage folks to go to Medicaid.gov and find out specifically the situation in their state. Got it. Thank you so much, Maida. I um, appreciate you trying to help us understand that um, a little bit better. Um, our next question uh, goes back to uh, a different immigration status, uh, and this person wants to know, 
I'm waiting currently for my DACA application to go through, or my deferred action application. Do I still need to get health insurance? Alvaro, can you help us answer that one, please? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, people with deferred action for childhood arrivals, or DACA, are not eligible to get coverage under the marketplaces. Um, they, that's a, they're, they're exempt from also the penalties, and so they're not going to be required to get insurance because they're not eligible under the, the federal exchanges or even state exchanges. At the same time, as I mentioned before, they may be eligible for different programs in their state, so it's worth checking with their state to see if they're eligible, for example, for certain uh, Medicaid programs like Medi-Cal in California, um, where they would be eligible, um, or other programs that are available to people regardless of their status. Um, also important is in a situation where they may have had a different status, so they were an asylee, for example, they can check healthcare.gov to see if their immigration status currently um, qualifies them as eligible for the federal marketplace. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so essentially, uh, the, those who have the deferred action status or are applying um, are not eligible for the healthcare under the marketplaces, uh, but they should check on their on their individual states and different statuses like asylees you mentioned should check on healthcare.gov to see um, if their state might cover them, correct? That's right. Okay, thank you. Um, a, a, tricky, a tricky question, um, but thank you so much for breaking that down a little bit more. Um, Alvaro, the, our next question, hopefully you can still help us out with this one. Uh, this comes from Christy, who has enrolled already. Uh, congratulations, Christy. She enrolled on the health insurance marketplace three weeks ago, but she has not received anything yet stating that she has health insurance. Uh, what should she do now? So for someone who has enrolled um, and hasn't received you know, some kind of proof that they've enrolled, they may, they may be covered, and so they should definitely check with the insurer, the, pers the, the insurance uh, company that they enrolled with, to see if they're on the books, um, because they should be able to get treatment. As long as they're on the insurer's list, they should be able to get any treatment and coverage that they need. Um, so the, the way they can do that is either they contact the insurer directly to make sure that they're enrolled. They should also make sure to check on either healthcare.gov or by calling the uh, marketplace call, call center um, to make to ensure that their application was processed and it's just pending, you know, just pending, um, just to ensure that they are in fact enrolled. Um, but that shouldn't stop them from contacting the insurer themselves uh, to, to see if they're on the books. And they can get more information about how to do that on healthcare.gov. Got it. Um, thank you. I appreciate that, Alvaro. Uh, Maida, um, we need know that we recently hit the 4 million mark of people who have enrolled uh, for health insurance, so that's really great, and we're happy about that milestone. Do we know of that number how many Latinos have signed up for health coverage through the marketplaces? It's a great question, and it's one we're getting a lot from folks because we want to know what kind of impact we're making in the populations that we know are disproportionately uninsured. But I think it's, it's important that folks know that when you put race and ethnicity on that application, reporting that information is voluntary. So not everyone that fills out that application is actually putting down their race and ethnicity. So right now we're trying to go through the data and find out if the information we are collecting is accurate enough to report out and say that it's re reflecting the diversity of the people applying. Um, because the, the last thing we want to do is report numbers that aren't accurately re uh, reflecting the diversity of that applicant pool. So we have really some numbers specific to like gender demographics and um, numbers across the country and where they're where where we're enrolling people. But at this time, we have yet to release race and ethnicity data. If we are able to get data that's accurate, we will definitely make that public. Got it. Thank you. Um, sure. You know, I think um, you know beyond trying to find out like who of which group has enrolled, it's just really important um, for us to encourage the people we do know to enroll regardless of of their Absolutely. status or, or their situation. Um, I, I think it's the numbers 10 million Latinos became eligible for health coverage under the law um, and with the numbers that we have we know that we still have a, a ways to go um, with that enrollment. Definitely, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Um, Samantha, um, hopefully you'll be able to help us with this question. Um, this question comes from Luz, and she wants to know, she's also gone through healthcare.gov to get coverage, um, so again, congrats to Luz. And she says, after I enroll online, how do I pay my bill? How do I pay my bill? When and where? 
that's a question we're hearing from a lot of people because a lot of people who have signed up for coverage, this is their first time having health insurance. So that's really exciting. For most people, they're going to get a bill in the mail about two weeks before their coverage is supposed to start. So if they have a start date of, let's say, April 15th, around April 1st, they should be getting a bill in the mail. Some people pay the bill writing a check and set mailing it in just like we all used to pay bills but some people also pay online so that's something that they can work out with their individual insurance company perfect thank you so essentially um, after you enroll reach out to your health insurance company about billing correct well they'll reach out to you <laughs> yeah, they, they will be in touch because they have to in addition to sending you a bill they're also going to be sending you your um, proof of insurance card and some other documentation information about your policy so you should within two to three weeks be getting information from them okay got it um, and I would just add that once you do have those cards make sure that you go use them um, if you have health coverage make sure that you are going to get your physicals your well woman exams um, and take advantage of that opportunity to take care of your health um, okay so another healthcare.gov question um, Alvaro Christine says that she keeps getting uh, an error message on healthcare.gov that says unable to verify um, and she has a work permit or resident alien card um, how what, what should she do or what's the reason that she's getting that so this is a, a really good and a really tough question. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are still a lot of technical problems with the healthcare.gov website. Um, and this is one that a lot of people are getting caught up in in terms of, um, you know, getting through the identity verification, also immigration status verification process. Uh, let me see if I can walk through a few steps that might help. Um, I think that the first thing is if you do get to this, what's called the yellow screen, that's telling you that you, um, they can't confirm your identity, um, log off and try back again a little later because we have heard ins instances where that has helped to just try again um, later. Uh, another option is actually to um, remove your application and resubmit um, and that has worked for some people to, to kind of, it, unfortunately starting all over but you, you can, it, it runs more smoothly the second time. Um, the other thing is to make sure that the information that you've submitted matches the documents that you're using. So on any identity document or immigration document, you want to make sure that, for example, if you had two last names listed on an immigration document, that you're submitting both of those names um, on the online application. So make sure that it all, all the information is matching up so that on the back end, that information is matching up as well. Um, if that doesn't work, you should definitely call the call center. They might be able to help you walk through um, the application process. Um, or get in-person assistance. Um, one, other thing, one other option as well is if you do get past the initial um, kind of block where it says they can't verify your identity, you may be asked to submit some of that, those um, documents either by mail or to upload them online. We recommend that you actually upload them online with your application because that ensures that the application and your documents are kind of kept together. Um, if you are going to mail them in, mm -hmm. make sure that you write your um, barcode number. You're going to be given a barcode number uh, when you submit an application. Make sure that that barcode number is on all of the documents that you submit by mail, just so that everything is uh, together on the back end. Got it. Thank you. Um, and when you say upload the documents, um, what's the easiest way for someone to do that? I mean, not everybody has access to a scanner or a a printer or a photocopy machine, maybe someone's, um, you know, doing this application at, at the public library, like what, what's the best way for them to upload a document in that situation? Yeah, well, in a situation like at the public library, you can definitely get the librarians to help you. They probably have scanners that they can help you uh, scan your documents and help you even uh, submit the application. A lot of librarians have actually been trained to help folks submit applications uh, for healthcare coverage. Um, you can also do that by getting help of in-person assisters who are also trained. Um, and can help you scan certain documents. So you just want to make sure that you have them with you um, and you can either make copies um, or, su or sub uh, scan those documents and, and upload them there. Got it. And for someone who's um, filling out the application or I guess filling out the application on the phone, um, how would they get their documents in? So those people will have to mail in documents um, and again they want to make sure that the barcode or application number that they are assigned when they're submitting their application is on all of the documents, um, either printed or typed onto the documents somehow, so that uh, when those documents are received, they're associated with that application. 
Got it. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. That's uh, a lot of tricky information, um, but it's information that we, we definitely need to hear. So thank you for that, Alvaro. Um, Alvaro, since you're in California, um, I'll fill this next question to you. This one comes from Ana in California, and she says, I am from California, and I heard that some DACA recipients may qualify for Medi-Cal depending on their age. Is this true? Um, and for those who aren't familiar, Medi-Cal is uh, uh, the state version of Medicaid in California. Um, Alvaro, what's the answer to that? Uh, the answer is, is, is yes. Uh, fortunately in California, because we have some state-funded programs that are kind of open to a larger group of people, that includes people with, with DACA status. And so, um, and in fact, it's been expanded to include even folks that are uh, on the higher ranges. Before, Medi-Cal was limited by age. Uh, now, even um, adults, um, even adults without children uh, who have DACA status, would be eligible for Medi-Cal as long as they're uh, within the income requirements. And so now anyone who is below 138% of the federal poverty line um, would be eligible for Medi-Cal in the state. So that includes DACA recipients here. Got it. Oh, welcome to Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. I'm so sorry I'm late. I was voting. I mean, that's <laughs> by constitution what I'm supposed to be doing. So sorry about that, but so excited you guys are here. <laughs> we're, so, we're so glad to have you on. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier uh, that you have an initiative in your um, district to make sure that your constituents are, are enrolling for health coverage. Can you tell us a little bit about that initiative? Certainly. It's called um, Enroll OC, and this came about because you know, about 38% of the people who live in my district have no health care plan at all. Hmm. So there have been several things that we've been doing. Um, in these three years, we've been getting ready for it. We went from um, one community clinic that was recognized by the federal government to 17, some of them with multiple spots. So we basically put clinics in people's neighborhoods. So when they would get their health care plan, they'd actually have some place to go and use it. So Enroll OC is about letting, in particular, everybody know that they've got till March 31st to get signed up. And um, so we, in the next 33 days, we've got over 20 events in the district where we're going to be go actually there with counselors, getting people to um, sign up right there on the spot, getting them information, making them understand what the different plans are, helping them pick it, showing them what their subsidy is, getting them into the Medi-Cal program or Healthy Starts or whatever it is that they qualify for and should have and need to have. So we're pretty excited about it. We're trying to get everybody signed up. That's great. No, thank you for sharing that information. Um, is there a website where the, the people who are listening who are in California or in your district can find out more information? You can always go to healthcare.gov and believe me, the website does work now. <laughs> and that has, <laughs> I say that because, you know, who knows who's listening to us, but that is the overall federal government website and it has the different listings of every state and where you can go. And in California, of course, it's covered California, so covered C-O-V, Vechica, as we say in Spanish, or the small V for Victor, C-O-V-E-R-E-D-C-A dot um, com. So California, uh, coveredcalifornia.com. And um, there's, there are tools, links and stuff to all of these different things where you can go in, there are calculators that can help you figure things out. Um, you can actually get signed online, but if you don't, you know, and it takes a while because you're going to have to make some ideas, you know, think about what your health's really like and what you really want and um, what you can really afford to pay. And it, it, so it's not about going on in 10 minutes getting it done. It's probably about, you've got to allocate about an hour if it's just you, if it's a family with, you know, somebody's got documents, somebody doesn't, somebody already has health care from work, somebody's on Medicare, etc. If you're complicated, it's going to take you about 90 minutes. Got it. Um, and, and the thing is, um, I think a lot of people have forgotten now that, that we have these new websites to help us enroll. They've forgotten that the process was probably even more complicated before because you had to list um, your pre-existing conditions or any medications that you were taking. Um, so even though it, it takes a while, um, it always has taken a while, and it's probably a little bit easier now than it was before. Um, thank you so much for bringing I, I that up. So. I think so. They, I, I'm so glad you said that. 
this um this this whole idea that somehow we can't get this done. Well, we can get this done. It's available to everyone. Remember, pre-existing conditions? Forget it. Uh, women over 50? <laughs> astronomical if you could get it. Um, now there's not any gender bias. Um, you know, if you're younger, you want catastrophic. If you're under 30 and you say, well, I'm pretty healthy, I just want catastrophic care, we have that available for you. And remember, for those of you over 30 who aren't going to be buying catastrophic but are going to be buying a real health care plan, they can't drop you. They cannot drop you. You get cancer, you get asthma, you get something. Before, they would drop you immediately. Not anymore. Um, now, uh, and, and not only that, preventive care. Preventive care is all free in each and every one of these plans. Why? Because we want you to go and get checked up. We want to make sure that everything's okay with you. If something's wrong, we want you to fix it. And if we can fix you, then it's a healthier America. Employees don't miss work. Your kids, you know, don't miss school. And we're all better off for it. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much. Um, it's also, you know, it's also really important for uh, people to be aware of the the coverage that's available, not just so that they can use it, but also so that um, if maybe their insurance company tries to charge them for something, they know, hey, uh, this well woman visit was supposed to be covered. Um, <laughs> so if anyone happens to be running into that, it's important to know um, to know your rights. Um, Congresswoman, a question. Um, so while we've been on this Hangout, we've talked a lot about um, we've talk, mentioned DACA, we've mentioned um, mixed status families, uh, we've mentioned uh, the different websites that we can use and uh, just how much the requirements vary from state to state. Um, and with that varying so much, um, is there a website or uh, one resource where people can find out if they qualify for affordable health care in their particular state? What's the best way? Well, um, at least in Covered California, you can go straight on Covered California and they will tell you whether you qualify for the Medi-Cal program, which on an individual basis is all based on how much you earn. So if you earn less than $16,000 AGI, adjusted gross income, um, then you will qualify for Medi-Cal and that's great and actually even Covered California will zip you over into the portion to sign up for Medi-Cal. If you are a family um, of four, four, so it's a sliding scale, so a family of four, I think probably up to about um, um, $32,000, mm -hmm. those so people will go on Medi-Cal, you know. Um, so it, it's about, you know, 8000 a person in, in that particular case of adjusted gross income for the household. If you, um, it, you know, anywhere between the 30000 and almost 90000 in that area, it's going to be on a sliding scale to go on to Covered California, choose the plan that you want. Now, I was over at a place called Altamed. They have um, clinics both in, I know for sure, in Los Angeles County, but we, we've worked with them to bring them into Orange County. They have a resource center in Santa Ana where you can actually go in there and um, and sit down. They've got the computers, they've got counselors, and they'll walk you through and everything. Their counselors were telling me that plans for most people in Santa Ana, um, which is a varied distribution of income per family, um, but a lot of lower income people, he, they told me that there were people buying plans, good health care plans. We're talking Health Net, we're talking um, Kaiser, um, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, these types of you know real known names. They told me that in some cases, in a lot of cases, people were picking up plans for $1 premium a month. Now think about that, $1 premium a month, you have your basic physical, your um, your pap smear, etc., ladies, and it's being picked up. You're not paying anything for preventive care. It's, they're pretty good plans. So people need to need need to go to coveredcalifornia.com. They need to go to healthcare uh, health yeah healthcare.gov at the federal level, and that will split off and tell you depending on the state that you're in um, where to go and what to find. Thank you so much. Um, you covered so much information. Um, we'll be, do a quick recap at the end of, of those websites. Um, but thank you for that, Congresswoman. Um, you know, the last thing I'll tell you, not to be partisan or anything, but for sure, 
the Democratic members of Congress, if you happen to live near one of them, in either one of their districts or nearby districts, call their office. I mean, they've got all these numbers, they've got all this information, they've got fact sheets, etc. So I don't know that very many of the Republicans, quite frankly, are doing it because remember they voted 41 times to try to get rid of this stuff. But definitely the Democratic members of Congress are working really hard to get this information out to people. So if push comes to shove, you don't know where to turn, call that member of Congress. And a friendly reminder that the Affordable Care Act will cover you regardless of of pre-existing conditions and regardless of party. <laughs> so important for all Americans um, to, to enroll. Um, a question for Maida. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, some of the unique situations that uh, people might face in their lives after March 31st when the enrollment period ends. Um, situations like, you know, getting pregnant or being um, graduating and getting off your student health plan, things like that. Uh, will will navigators be available to help those in those unique situations after March 31st? Uh, for those who might not be familiar with that term, navigators are people who can help you enroll in person. Um, so we've mentioned a lot healthcare.gov and cuidadodesalud.gov, um, but on those websites you can look up um, your neighborhood and see where it, where in your area you might be able to find in-person help. Um, so Maida, will those people still be available after March 31st? Well, in some places they, they, they will be because we have what we call, and we've always had this in the insurance industry, it's what we call um, a change in life. A change, some, some major change in life happens. Um, you lose your job. You know, all of a sudden you've lost your insurance um, because maybe you were covered by that, that company. Or you're having a baby. Or you get married. Um, or you move. You move from one state to another or you move from a county within California, for example. Those are all change of life and so that's an opportunity. That is the one point in the whole year where you can go in and get a new um, a new insurance or change your, your circumstances or change your plan, etc. I think the only thing to add on top of what the Congresswoman said is that navigators or in-person assisters, um, depending on where they're uh, housed or located, they will be available throughout the year. There are a variety of uh, in-person assistant locations like health centers that actually have enrollment workers year-round. So it's important to know that help is going to be available. And in addition, what we're trying to see is how navigators, how these in-person assisters that have made these relationships with people can be utilized to help people navigate the healthcare system. So now you have your insurance card, how do you use it? How do you make sure you know which doctors in your network? How do you know what preventive services are right for your age? So that's something we're thinking about to explore with navigators that are going to be available year round. But absolutely there's going to be assistance available and we encourage folks to go to localhelp.healthcare.gov to find that in-person assistance in your neighborhood. Thank you, Maida. Yeah. They're also going to be available. They, they probably will also be available in most places where you would think they should be, you know, emergency hospital rooms. They'll probably be, you know, somebody trained up there and a nav navigator in the system who can get you signed up in case, you know, something has happened to you. So um, in most of the places that you would think they would be, they're probably still going to be a few peppered here and there. So it's not like you're going to have to drive 200 miles to find a navigator. They'll, they'll be in the local neighborhoods. Great, thank you. Um, again, I'll just recap quickly the places where people can enroll. Um, healthcare.gov, we've mentioned already. Cuidado de Salud. Gov, uh, with a little v, uh, for those who may be helping a family member enroll in Spanish. Um, there's also a phone number we haven't mentioned yet. Um, that phone number is 1-800-318-2596, and that phone number is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in over 150 languages. Um, so regardless of, of your family status or what language they may speak, um, you can get help there. And Maida just mentioned um, localhelp.healthcare.gov where you can look up in your neighborhood, in your community, where you can go to get help in person. Um, and you can even use a combination of those. You don't have to you know, do it all in one thing. If you want to be on the website and on the phone, <laughs> they'll help you. Um, so, so don't be afraid of, of the process. Um, it might seem a little bit overwhelming, but it's, it's worth it. Vale la pena uh, because taking care of our health is important and it's an investment um, in the future and those of us who um, 
who fall into the the millennial category, um, you know, a lot of time, especially in the Latino families, we're the ones who are making sure that our family understands these these laws and are making sure that um, our parents know how to hop on these websites. So um, I feel that we as young people have a leadership role to take in making sure that that our, our family's health is taken care of. Um, so I just would encourage. Uh, uh, those of you who are watching to make sure that your family and your friends and your loved ones are, are aware of these resources. Um, we're, we're at the close of our hangout today, but I wanted to give um, like a minute to each of our panelists just for any, any closing comments or just final words of advice to the Voto Latino audience as they are, are going through this enrollment process. Um, Alvaro, uh, let me start with you, and then we'll go to Samantha, uh, Mayra, and we'll close with the Congresswoman. Uh, thank you, Ann Larian. Thank you, Voto Latino, for, for putting this hangout uh, together. It was really fun to participate. Thank you to all the other participants, including the Congresswoman, um, for getting all this really important information out there. Um, you know, I think, as Jan Lee just said, it's important for us to spread the word. We have, a, you know, a short window before the end of the first open enrollment period um, to get a lot of people enrolled, and then we'll have another chance when, when there's another enrollment period. So. Um, there's a lot of work to do, but we can do it together. And there are a lot of resources specifically on these immigration questions that we went over on NILC's web website, the National Immigration Law Center, at www.nilc.org. Um, so you can find information there. Just uh, type in healthcare or healthcare for immigrants in the search function. Or in fact, look at our website at nilc.org slash ACA facts, um, and you can find a lot of resources there. I just want to congratulate all of the people on the Hangout for taking the initiative to find out more information, especially about mixed status families. I know that this Affordable Care Act is really the first time a lot, millions of Americans are going to have access, financial or otherwise, to be able to have insurance. And I think that it's great that they're asking questions. I encourage you to keep asking questions because as you go through the process, maybe we answered some of your questions today, but when you sign on to healthcare.gov and start filling out the application, you might have more questions. Don't get discouraged. Call the hotline number, see an in-person assister, and really keep at it because it is so worth it and your family will benefit from it tremendously. So uh, Hispanic Federation and Voto Latino, HHS, the Congresswoman and the National Immigration Law Center, our, our support to you does not stop with this Google Hangout. Reach out to us online, Twitter, Facebook or in any, any way you feel comfortable and we want to continue the conversation. Thank you. Maida. Sure. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you to Voto Latino for hosting this Google Hangout and for helping spread the word about the importance of the health insurance marketplace. I think for the Latino community especially, you know, we're disproportionately uninsured. In our community, our numbers are growing in every state across the country. We want to contribute to our communities. We want to do well in our workplaces. We want to be successful in school. We want to be able to graduate and find that great first job. All of those things are made much more possible when we have the security that health insurance provides. The health insurance marketplace is going to offer 10 million of us that security, uh, but we can only do it if we actually reach everyone that we want to reach. So I'm grateful for the partnerships that Voto Latino, National Immigration Law Center, the Hispanic Federation, and of course the tremendous members of Congress like Congresswoman Chat Sanchez and their leadership to ensure that every eligible Latino enrolls by March 31st. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Maida. Um, Congresswoman, final words for our audience today? I want to let you all know that when we passed the Affordable Care Act, it was a very narrow vote. And the Latino members of Congress, um, we voted for it because we knew how important it was to our community. So we did our part, and we've taken a lot of knocks for doing that. We, you know, suffered, we lost. Uh, quite a few of our members in the last election cycle, um, but we thought that this law was one of the most important things that we could do, in particular for the Latino community, it's really for everybody. I mean, everybody should have a health plan they can count on, where they can go in, and if they do their part, if they take the responsibility, if they eat better, if they exercise, go walking after they eat, or what have you, all those things that we know we should do, and Sometimes we don't. My mom makes great antojitos for me, and it's hard to, you know, stop at one. But that if you, you know, we did our part. 
We need you to do your part. Your part is to sign up. Your part is to talk to your parents, is to talk to your friends, to get them to sign up. Because if we can do this, if we can do this the way we envision it, America will be healthier. And because Latinos in particular, and we're the youngest population of any group in the nation, and we are in just a few years going to be about 25%, one out of every four Americans is going to be a Latino, then it's inherent upon us to be healthy, to be healthy because we are going to drive this nation. We are going to make the future of this nation. And so you have to be healthy to do that. And, and that's why we voted for it. That's why we need it. That's why we want you to do your part. And the first piece is to sign up for it. So let everybody know. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to, again, thank our panelists, Alvaro, Mayra, Samantha, Congresswoman Sanchez. Thank you so much for being with us. You are the experts, and um, you're the ones that our, our community needs to hear from when they have questions about this law. Um, as much good as the law can do for the community, um, it's not going to do good if people don't understand how it applies to them. So thank you so much uh, to you and to your organizations, um, HHS, um, Hispanic Federation, and um, the National Immigration Law Center, and Congresswoman, thank you for your, for your leadership and thank you um, for being with us. If you want to stay, um, stay uh, updated on, on more of, of the happenings with the law and be reminded about deadlines, uh, Voto Latino has a webpage, latinosforhealthcare.com, that uh, you can sign up for updates and get emails from us. We'll keep make sure that you know when these deadlines are happening. And I love that Samantha mentioned that you can reach out to any of our organizations anytime. You can tweet us. You can go to Facebook and find us. Um, and we'll make sure that you have the answers that that you need. Um, we're also Voto Latino. At least I'm not sure about. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody else's organization. We're also on on Google Plus, so you can find us and reach out to us um, on any of these platforms, and we'll make sure that you are connected with someone who knows if we can't answer it for you. So thank you again to everybody, and um, a special thank you to the Ford Foundation for uh, making this hangout and our other hangouts possible. Um, thank you so much. Hope you have a great day. Thank you.